so it's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host for tonight, Heather Cook, joining you live from my dorm in Worcester, Ohio. I'm a sophomore at the College of Worcester studying political and science and history, and I work at the Behringer Crawford Museum as a visitor services associate while I'm not in school. Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of the Behringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors, Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph B. Hale Jr. Foundation, as well as our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. You can learn more and join at our website, which is bcmuseum.org. Before we begin, let's go over a few reminders for tonight. If you have a question or comment to share, you can type it into the chat or the Q&A feature, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible immediately following the presentation. There will also be a trivia question tonight. The first respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat on Zoom or on Facebook Live will win a Northern Kentucky History Hour prize, and most importantly, bragging rights. So let's meet tonight's speaker, Dave Schroeder, the 2017 recipient of BCM's Two-Headed Calf Service to History Award and our very first Northern Kentucky History Hour presenter, was named Executive Director of the Kenton County Library in 2007. He previously was archivist for Thomas More College and the Diocese of Covington from 1996 until 2000, returning to KCPL in 2000 as the Kentucky History Librarian. He serves as president of Board of the Friends of the Kentucky Public Archives and is a past member of the Kentucky Archives and Records Commission from 2007 until 2018. Schroeder is the past chair of the Kentucky Public Library Association and past president of the Kentucky Library Association and chair of the Kentucky Public Library Association Advocacy Committee. He is also a member of the American Library Association Advocacy Committee. Dave, welcome. If you're ready, we can go ahead and get started. Okay, let me pull up my screen here. Am I, uh, can you see it? Yep, you're all good. Okay, so um, some of you have probably heard me speak on this topic before. Um, it's my most requested uh, presentation um, throughout the year and sometimes um, I, I uh, it, it's interesting how many people, I, I'm surprised how many people still don't know about it because I've been uh, spreading the word for, for so long. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's dear to my heart because I grew up around here. You know, I grew up in the neighborhood where the park was located and um, my parents um, grew up not too far, my father grew up not too far from there. And my grandparents actually, um, I went to dates here. So um, the park um, holds a lot of um, fond memories for me or what was left of the park when I was a kid playing down in that area. And it always grabbed my attention as a budding historian. So um, it's something that I really do enjoy talking about. And um, I think it's a neat part of our history that people are always interested in. I thought today I would mix it up a little bit and talk a little bit as we go along about the craft of history as well. So how do historians work? Um, I think it's important uh, for people to understand how much goes into doing a proper history of anything, an organization, a place, an event, um, and how much work goes into that. So I'll be um, talking about sources as we go along as well. Uh, but um, let's just move on. Um, so this is um, probably the best picture of the park. It's not crisp. Uh, clear, but it's pretty clear. Uh, it gives you a nice um, kind of major outline of what the park looked like at its height. Uh, and we'll be talking about a lot of what you see in this picture as I go along. So, well, there we go. Um, oops, went one too many. Okay, so if we're looking at a map, this is an 1884 map of um, Northern Kentucky, uh, particularly of the Northern uh, Kenton County. This pink area here is the city of Covington. This is West Covington, which is now a neighborhood in Covington. So this is now annexed as part of Covington. 
And this was this, this is the city of Lalo as it appeared in 1884. And this is the city of Bromley. Now, there was no lake before the, the lagoon started. Uh, there is this stream, it's still there. It's called the Pleasant Run, runs through here and it empties out into the Ohio River about where right around here would have been the Ludlow Bromley Yacht Club. Do you all remember the Ludlow Bromley Yacht Club? It's right where the, um, the Pleasant Run um, enters the Ohio River. The road that follows the Pleasant Run is Bromley Crescent Springs Road, or it used to be called the Pleasant Run Turnpike. Um, this road is the one that's been closed for so long and just reopened yesterday, which I'm very excited about because it's been closed for two years and it's the way I get to work. So uh, I'm so happy to have this road back open. Um, but in 1884, there was a major flood and a lot of this area through here, this lowlands, you'll see there's hills here, there's hills here. This lowland in between, including Bromley, flooded in 1884. There was, an 18, there was a flood in 1883 and 1884. And the promoters of the park saw a natural lake form in between Lalo and Bromley, which made them start thinking about, well, are there possibilities there? Um, something happened about the same time. So in the 1890s, so about a decade later, um, the city of Lalo and the city of Covington came to an agreement with the Green Line Streetcar Company. Um, which actually his name is the Cincinnati Newport and Covington uh, Street Railway Company, uh, but we all called it the Green Line, uh, came to an agreement to build a, um, a trolley car line to Ludlow. So that's this darker line here. Um, it follows um, the Highway Avenue between Ludlow and Covington. So it's following that road. Highway Avenue was actually built to accommodate the streetcar line. So uh, the streetcar line is following it. It goes into Ludlow. The idea was to go to Bromley and then to turn around. So it's turning around here and it's going back. Now, the people who own the street rail company. railroad company. Yes. Um, would you mind sharing your trivia question before you go on? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the trivia question will be, I'm going to be talking about a ride that is uh, based on automobiles. And I'm going to ask you what brand automobile that was. So be, be, care, uh, be watching out for that. So uh, the street railway um, was doing its thing. The, the people that owned it were looking for things for the, what they call the end of the line. So there were ends of the line uh, in Bellevue and Dayton. And at the end of the line in Bellevue and Dayton were, was Tacoma Park and Manhattan Beach. At the end of the Fort Thomas line was the fort. At the end of the Fort Mitchell line was the um, uh, was, was uh, Edelweiss Gardens, which became the Greyhound Tavern, which still is there. And uh, Stevie's Cafe, uh, which had a previous name as well. Uh, and they were looking at the end of the Latonia line was the racetrack. So they were looking for something at the end of the line in Lalo that would bring people not only because streetcars were basically built to get people to work in Cincinnati and back. They were looking for things that would bring people to use the streetcar during the evenings and on weekends. And so uh, they also were looking at those floods from the decade earlier and thought, we can build an artificial lake in between Lalo and Bromley if we dam the Pleasant Run. So they built a dam in, eight, in the 1890s, in 1894 actually, and they built or they formed the lake. So that's how the lake comes about. And again, the, the backers of this project bought the property um, and developed the park. They were also the backers of the Green Line Streetcar Company. So this was a way of producing more money um, for the streetcar company and for its investors. So the grand opening is May 18th, 1895. Um, some of the initial rides included um, um, the, the um, the boathouse, which is right here, um, the dance pavilion, which is here. It was one of the largest dance pavilions west of New York City. Um, the, the scenic railroad or the scenic railway, which is this right here, which is actually one of the uh, a, a early form of the roller coaster, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
and the lake itself was a major attraction. You know, boating was very popular. So you'll see these are electric launches that were bought um, in, from the Chicago Columbian Exposition, which was held a few years before. Um, the lagoon, the operators of the lagoon bought these boats and had them shipped from Chicago to Lalo. You also could get canoes, you could rent all kinds of boats. Uh, there was also a, a sandy, a narrow bathing beach here that you could bathe, uh, or you could, uh, you know, uh, lay out on the, on the sand or uh, go into the water. Um, the lake, depending on where you were, could be as deep as 40 feet and as shallow as uh, three or four feet. So depending on where you were, it was a fairly sizable lake, about 80 acres, and it, it contained five islands on it. Um, so um, it was a significant body of water. Um, the, 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 these are two of the earliest buildings. They were designed by John Boll, B-O-L-L, -L, who was an architect from the city of Ludlow. Um, he built St. Boniface Church, and his claim to fame is he designed the first Carnegie Library in Covington. So if you're familiar with the Carnegie Art Center, he was the architect for the Carnegie Art, Art Center on uh, Scott Street in Covington, which still stands and was our library's original home. He also designed these original buildings at the Lagoon. This is the clubhouse. This massive building was built for $6,000 in, uh, in 1895. Uh, this is the entry. So you can see the streetcar tracks here. So the streetcars pulled right up. There was a barn over here. They would pull into the barn. You would get off and you would pay uh, an admissions fee. Um, there was a very slight admissions fee. The way the parks ran in those days were that you paid um, per ride. So you, you paid a very small fee to get in. Anything else you wanted to do, you paid a fee to do that. So it wasn't like at Kings Island where you pay one fee to get in and then you can write anything you want. You paid a very small fee and then whatever you wanted to do, you paid another fee to do that. So you could pay the three cent fee to get in when it opened and then just walk around the lake or swim or do anything you wanted like that for free. If you wanted to ride the rides, it was extra. Um, We'll talk about the clubhouse a little bit later. The clubhouse was used mainly, the first floor was mainly dining. Um, so this was, this was the, the major dining facility at the park. Um, they had uh, waiters, um, they had a full bar um, and uh, it was fine dining. Uh, and they also had these beautiful wraparound verandas. So they had wonderful views of the lake. Um, and so this building was primarily used as, um, as a, um, is fine dining and I'll show you a little bit later where you could um, the midway where you could actually get other kinds of food as well. Uh, here's some other things that were early on. Here's that boat house I was talking to you about. So this is where you could rent boats. You can see all the canoes here. This is where you got on those electric launches to go out into um, onto the lake. Behind it is the theater. It's hard to see here in this picture, but this is the, uh, the theater. It was originally a vaudeville theater, so it was live performances. And then later it became one of Northern Kentucky's first moving picture theater houses. So uh, they were showing um, silent movies and then eventually the talkies. Uh, but um, this was um, a very early theater in Northern Kentucky and it was a, a great draw um, to the park. But the, the lake though was always, a huge draw for the park. Think about it, it was usually only open during like April, maybe May through um, the end of the summer. Um, and so it, it was a seasonal park and uh, it was open during the height of summer. No one had air conditioning during this time period. This is the, the late 1800s. Um, and so people were looking for ways to keep cool. So um, going to a large body of water where you could go out onto the boats, where you could ride rides, uh, where you could get into the water if you wanted to, um, was a great way to cool off uh, in the summer months. Um, this is that beach I was talking about. It's not much of a beach, but it is a little bit of a beach. I always think it's interesting to see how people dress. So, you know, these guys in full suits and their bowler hats. This young woman is wearing a dress down to uh, below, her, uh, below her knees, between her knees and ankles. Um, the boys are actually wearing the wool bathing suits that they used to wear in the water. Um, I told you I would talk a little bit about sources. Most of what we know about the early history of the park, we know from newspaper articles. 
So um, the newspaper, um, the Kentucky Post and the Kentucky Enquirer, and um, later on the Time Star covered heavily everything that went on at the park. Um, it was the largest amusement park in Northern Kentucky and, and really uh, rivaled Coney Island for many, many years and Chester Park, which was also in Cincinnati. So it was a major attraction. Uh, and many people came to the park, not only from Northern Kentucky, across Northern Kentucky, but also from Cincinnati. A significant part of the crowd every night, every day, were from were Cincinnati residents as well. So it, it had a, a broad appeal across the region. And so the newspapers covered um, the park very well. And the park also used the newspapers for advertisements. So whenever they opened a new ride, there was an article in the paper. Um, there was something in the paper about what was happening at the lagoon. And um, almost every, um, every week, there was an article um, about what was going on in amusements in Northern Kentucky. So talking about theaters, vaudeville, the lagoon was covered heavily in those. So we have the Post, the Enquirer, and we have the Time Star that tell us a lot about, um, about the early days of the lagoon. Um, we also have maps. I showed you those two earlier maps. Um, there's other maps that exist too um, that, that show us the, the, the park. And so we've learned a lot uh, from maps. Uh, we have also, um, well, I'll talk about that later. Um, here's another picture of the boathouse. Again, I, I love the way people are dressed. Um, you know, some, at least the guys have taken their jackets off now for the most part. Uh, you can see the oarsmen here. So uh, you could rent a boat and take it out on your own, or you could rent a boat and um, you could have an oarsman come with you and you could just sit back. Um, you and your friend, whoever that may be, could sit back in the boat and uh, take a leisurely um, lap or two around the lake. Uh, this is one of those electric launches. Um, it, was, it was originally made for the Columbian Exposition, uh, which was the um, anniversary of a Columbus uh, discovery of America. Um, it was uh, held in, um, in Chicago in 1892 um, for the uh, anniversary. And uh, much of the items from the exposition were sold, including the electric launches. The Lagoon bought those electric launch, bought, I believe, 12 of these and moved them uh, to Lalo for use there. This is a good idea. This is the, um, the roller coaster. I'll talk about that um, next. But that kind of gives you an idea of where it was. This is the trestle. The trestle has been rebuilt a bit, but it's still there. So this is the trestle that goes across Sleepy Hollow Road. So Sleepy Hollow Road is cutting through here. Uh, and then eventually wraps its way around where the swim club is, which Lola Bromley Swim Club will be behind this hill and then goes up to Devil Street. So um, a lot of this uh, park um, today, if you're looking, if you're driving down Sleepy Hollow Road, you would be underwater um, when the park was open. Now, the, the amusement park, uh, the Scenic Railroad was a huge attraction. Um, and it's very interesting. And it, it was built in 1895 uh, by a man named LaMarcus Thompson. Um, we know this because um, we have multiple newspaper articles that mention LaMarcus Thompson is in town. He's designing the, the scenic railway. Um, and they describe what a scenic railway is. It's basically a very early version of a roller coaster. It was gravity fed at first and then was motorized later on. But you would basically climb a tower, gravity would feed you, would feed the car to do the loop. It gets out to the middle of the lake or a little bit out into the lake. It does a corkscrew three times and then returns. Um, and I'll show you some other pictures where um, you can see people actually on the cars. Um, but uh, Thompson, I just found the name in the newspaper. And so I started, I did a quick Google search. I found him online on Google. Um, and um, it turns out that he um, was one of the pioneers in the roller coaster field. Um, I never, I never consider Wikipedia to be a, a, a primary source. That's where I found the information at first. So I started looking at um, books on the history of roller coaster or amusement rides. I found several. Uh, we do not own them at the county library. Um, they're very specific kinds of books. Um, 
but there are a couple of these books that are in libraries in other parts of the country. And through the interlibrary loan system, I was able to go here to the library, request them as interlibrary loan. Those libraries sent them to Kenton County and I was able to use the books and then return them. So I found out that uh, Thompson um, built the first um, roller coaster, uh, one of the earliest roller coasters in the 1880s. Um, he built a roller coaster at Coney Island and at uh, several other major uh, East Coast um, amusement parks. Um, he was truly the pioneer of this kind of amusement ride. And so considering he built the first um, scenic railway in 1887 and he built the one in Ludlow in 1895, um, it, it's only a seven year old technology by the time this one opens in Ludlow. So this is kind of cutting edge technology. Uh, it was cutting edge amusement ride. Um, it was a huge draw to the park. Uh, people had never seen a ride like this before. Um, and it was something they really wanted to experience. And it was the first one in our region. It was the first roller coaster in our region that we know of. Um, and so by using newspaper articles, by using books that were based on primary resources, and by using a biography of Thompson, I was able to tie that package together. Um, and um, it was pretty exciting to see that, you know, not only did we have one of the earliest roller coasters in the country here in Northern Kentucky, but it was designed by the, the grandfather, of the, you know, the father of roller coaster technology. So um, another great um, thing to add to the history of the lagoon. We will see throughout the history of the lagoon, they were always using talent from across the country um, to bring in new attractions and to attract new people to the park. Here you can see people in, uh, in the boat. You can see small children, the big brimmed hats. This woman's hat is huge. Uh, but again, you know, it, it's a different time. And I, I just love those snapshots of people out having fun uh, in the summer and doing things that we see as very familiar to us. We would still do this today. Um, the difference is we could go home to our air conditioning. They went home to a house that maybe was in the 90s um, in, in a crowded urban environment. So you can see the appeal of coming to a park like this. Uh, we also had one of the first uh, merry-go-rounds in the area. This is a, a merry-go-round uh, that was, again, bought at the Columbian Exposition, taken apart in Chicago and moved here. It was electric. You can see it actually there. They are um, advertising that it's an electric merry-go-round. Um, this is the outside. Um, but again, this is... Um, Another big draw for the lagoon was it, it had electricity very early on at a time period where people didn't even have electricity necessarily in their homes. The park was originally lit by gas, but as soon as electric became available, uh, they built a, an electric plant and they electrified much of the park, including putting electric lights all the way around the lake. So that was another huge draw. People, many people had not seen electricity on this scale. And so, you know, we're gonna have Blink in a couple of weeks at, um, at here in Greater Cincinnati. Uh, and by the way, the Covington Library is gonna be lit up. We're very excited. The Covington Library is part of Blink this year. Uh, this was kind of, the, the lagoon was kind of an early version of Blink. And you can see one of the posts here um, and you can see that they're advertising electric. That was a big thing for the early years of the park. This is the interior. So this is what the merry-go-round looked like. These were all hand-carved figures, hand-painted. Uh, when the park closed, we assume this ride was taken down, dismantled, and sold. We do not know that for sure. And we've never been able to find out where it went, if it went in one piece or if the individual pieces were sold. A lot of times each figure was sold separately. Um, sometimes they were kept together. I would love to know what, what happened to the, the Ferris wheel here. And if it still exists, it could be in some park somewhere in the United States that's still working. We just don't know. Uh, but you also can see, again, you can see the electric bulb here. So you can see the interior of the structure was electric. So again, light was a big attraction. This was a small railroad that uh, circled the lake. So Lala was a huge railroad town with the Cincinnati Southern. Northern Kentucky in general uh, relied heavily on the railroads. 
Um, so again, a, a, a nice picture tying local history into the local um, economy. Uh, again, the, the clothing, this woman here in the back with her bonnet on. Uh, this is a great view of the scenic railroad. So this is, you can see the, the tower would be here where you got on. Here's a car with people sitting on it. You can see that. It would go down, it would go into this structure. This is all built over the lake. It would do three corkscrews in here, shoot back out and then return. Um, so really nice shot of the scenic railroad. Very primitive to our standards of a roller coaster. But think about it. This was the first time people had seen a roller coaster probably in this region. Uh, and again, you'll see all these electric lights being strung that are surrounding the, the, the park. Um, it must have been a real sight to pull up in the evening on a streetcar and see this beautiful lake from the top of the hill lit all the way around with all the with all of the rides lit up. Um, it would have been a spectacular sight for people of that time period. Another nice view of the scenic railroad with the trestle behind it. So this trestle is still here. This is that same trestle that goes over uh, Sleepy Hollow Road. So if you're familiar with that, you know where I'm talking about. Uh, the baseball park, uh, Carlisle Field, the small baseball park would be about right here. The trails now, the bicycle trails would go underneath here and go up into the hillside. So this is, um, this is all very much still here. It just is no longer covered by water. This also, however, gives you a really nice look at, you know, the boats on, on the river. And again, you can see people actually riding the ride. Um, so another beautiful view of uh, the park. And, you know, when this was all green in the summer and you could see the blue of the water, um, you can imagine the appeal if it's 90 degrees outside and you're living in a tenement in Covington or Cincinnati or Newport and you want to um, get out of the city and cool off, um, this was a way to do it. And it was a streetcar right away. This was another, um, um, a, uh, another ride that was developed um, by a national figure. It's called the Shoot the Shoots. Um, and basically there's a tower here. You go up into it. There are cars, you can see one here. It's really an early version of the log flume. So you would get into a car at the top, the car would be released, um, it would slide down the slide, there was a little bit of a dip here and it would flip up a little bit and then it would skid across the water. They would pull it back and then you would start all over again. Um, this was built by Paul Boynton, B-O-Y-T-O-N. Um, again, his name is in the local newspapers that he was in town uh, and he was developing a new ride. So again, I did my research on Paul Boynton, um, found um, in another book about amusement parks. He was a pioneer in water um, attractions in parks. Um, he built um, the first Shoot the Shoots in Lion Park at Coney Island in New York. Um, he, this was one of the only five when this one was built in the early 1900s. Um, so it was very cutting edge again. There was none in this area. Um, the problem was that um, oftentimes the cars, when they would hit the water, um, would hit it with such velocity that it, um, it caused injuries. People were not, there, there was no seat belts. There was nothing restraining you. You were sitting in this car and when it hit the water, it, when it skidded across the water, depending on how it hit, um, it was dependent on how rough your landing was. Uh, it didn't last for too long. Uh, it was, as far as we can tell, it opened in 1896 and by the mm, early 1900s, it was gone. So you can kind of date photographs of the lagoon by the shoot the shoots. If it's there, it's between that 1896-1905 time period. If it's not there, it's either before 1896 or after 1905. Uh, but again, um, there are some really good books about amusement parks out there. And then we have those newspaper articles. And there's a number of good biographies on Paul Boynton that um, directed me towards finding out more about this ride. Um, eventually, he adapted the ride. Uh, it became more of the log flume that we're familiar with. But again, he was the father of this technology. And here he is in Ludlow very early on building this state-of-the-art 
uh, ride in Ludlow uh, that people were enjoying. Again, the people who own the park were looking at uh, ways to bring new visitors and something novel. And this was something novel. And so it was something that really attracted people. Uh, this is a nice view of the dance hall. So the, the first floor um, was dancing and concessions and the second floor was open air dancing. It was again, one of the largest dance halls west of New York City. They did have dance marathons uh, in here. If you've ever seen the, uh, or heard about the dance marathon craze. Um, this building actually lasted after the park closed for a while. And so it was used until the early 1920s. Um, so it survived a little bit longer than the park. Um, but it, it was a, another big attraction. You know, dancing um, was a big attraction. Um, this is part of um, the Midway. Um, and we'll, I'll talk about the Midway in a minute. But this was a balloon ascension ride. So you could actually do a, um, a, 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 a um, hot air balloon ride. So, um, and it, this was... Um, Hot air balloons had existed around the time of the Civil War. They were using them in the Civil War, but they were still very novel for ordinary everyday people to use. And so you could buy a ticket and you could go up in the air balloon. Um, they used them on and off at the lagoon. A couple of times though, they had problems where um, the tethering, the, the ropes broke. Uh, one time, um, one of the balloons ended up in Price Hill. Uh, another time, one of them ended up in Villa Hills near uh, what would become Villa Madonna Academy. So uh, many of them um, actually broke away. The idea was to take you up to see the park and then they would pull you back down. On at least two occasions, the ropes broke. So people got an extra ride to Price Hill or to uh, what is today uh, Villa Hills, um, which probably um, was uh, quite a frightening event, I would think for many of them. Uh, because sometimes there was an expert in the balloon and sometimes there wasn't. We don't know on these two particular occasions. We do know that the Post and the Enquirer covered it. So uh, we are, um, we, uh, we do know that those two incidents occurred. Um, and there are a number of photographs, again, of, of the air balloons being used. And again, you can see the novelty of it with all the people standing around and watching. And you can, you can just imagine some of these people saying, there's no way in the world I would ever do that. And then other people who, you know, this is before airplanes. And so these people, you know, going up there, and there were no tall skyscrapers at this time in our region. And so going up in an odd air balloon was an extremely novel event to be able to see something from that far above and look down and, and you know, see the whole park laid out before you. Um, was, you know, just something that most people had never experienced. Um, and so this was a real novelty and it wasn't cheap. Um, people paid a, 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 a fine price to actually use the balloon. The Midway was part, uh, came out of the Columbian Exposition I talked about, the Chicago World's Fair. Um, the Midway kind of developed at the Chicago World's Fair. They were looking at ways to make more money. And so they built a midway. So this long promenade uh, and on each side were games of chance and food stands. Uh, nothing novel to us. We see them in these parks all the time. Uh, in the 1890s though, and later they were still fairly new. You know, you might have a food stand here or there, but this whole idea of walking down this promenade and be surrounded by games of chance and food booths was new. And so, we do know that the founders of the Lagoon went to the Columbian Exposition because, again, newspaper accounts. They covered, uh, the newspaper covered stories of um, the investors um, and their wives and families going to the Columbian Exposition. And so we have a list of those from the newspaper who went to the Columbian Exposition. Um, and they were society people. And so they were covered in the newspaper. Um, it was, um, you know, something that was in the society section of the Post and the Enquirer in those days. Here is a typical, um, a game that we're very familiar with. This is the ring toss. You can see the guys are holding uh, rings on a stick. You would throw the rings. If you look really closely at this picture though, it's interesting because you can see what they're throwing them at. These are all knives with the blades stuck into wood. 
And then you can see in the front, there's a couple of pistols. There's one here and one here, and there's one here. So if you get the ring over the pistol, either the handle or uh, the muzzle, or if you got it over the handle of the knife, you want it. Um, today, can you imagine if you won a knife or a gun at, uh, at an amusement park and you were given it and told, you know, when you leave, take it with you, um, what happened today? Simpler times, different times, but um, a very simple game that's still played today. You know, our, our great grandparents, our grandparents were playing this 100 years ago. So just uh, two examples, the, the waffle stand and the ring toss were part of that midway. And there were all kinds of activities that lined the midway. This is the automobile air ride that was put in, in, in 1909. Um, it was an elevated track and it had Buick cars on it. So there were Buick, Buick touring cars that were bought specifically for this ride. It was an elevated track and they called it, they called it a, a car ride in, in the treetop. This was when cars 1909 were still relatively new. And so um, being able to drive on an elevated track above the tree line and sometimes in the tree line was a very novel thing. Um, many people did not own their own car. So this might've been the only chance they got to drive a car. Um, and if you, if you look at it, I think what's really interesting is the technology. They still have these, these kind of rides today, you know, they're the little, um, the race car drivers, but um, the race car rides that still exist in museum parks, amusement parks. But there was the one at Kings Island for years that was the old touring cars like this one that, that, that um, they call in the old time, I forget what the ride was called, but it was these old kind of cars, but they're still working on the same basic technology. If you see, there is this rail that runs down the middle of the track. If you go into these rides today, you'll still see that rail. The rail is what's keeping the car on the track. So the car cannot get off the rail. So no matter how you, erratically you drive, you weren't able to drive it off the edge. This rail is keeping the car on the track. Uh, this was a very popular ride. It was built north of the park. Um, this is actually in the neighborhood where I live today. So um, it's very possible that my house sits on the <laughs> on this uh, somewhere where this ride was. Uh, but again, very popular part of the park. And again, a way of using new technology, 1909, using cars to sell the park and to get more people to come to the park. And again, you were paying for each ride. So if you wanted to go on the shoots the shoots and you wanted to go on uh, the scenic railroad and you wanted to go on the automobile air ride, you had to pay to go on each one. So each one of these attractions was making money on its own. The merry-go-round, if you wanted to go on that, you had to pay extra, so. Uh, this is one of those Buick touring cars. And uh, the interesting thing with a lot of the photographs that we have are women driving the cars. Um, if you were lucky enough in this time period to own a car, it was typically the male that drove. Um, at the amusement park, it was acceptable for women to drive as well. So a lot of times you'll see women in these old photos at the lagoon driving the car. Um, and you can see again, you can see the track clearly here down the middle of the road. And you can see there's an apparatus attached to the underside of the car that is going on that track and making sure the car is not deviating one way or the other. So it didn't matter how great of a driver you were you weren't going to go off the edge. Um, but it was, again, a great attraction during that time period and um, was really uh, cutting edge for its time. Although that car does not look cutting edge, but uh, I think there'd be a lot of collectors right now who would love to have that car. You can see this is the elevated um, ride through here. So this was the entrance pavilion to get on the ride. Uh, the midway is running down here. This was another attraction was called the Fair Japan. So uh, there was the Japanese-Russian War in the early 1900s. So Japan and Russia went to war. Everybody assumed Russia was going to win. They were going to defeat the Japanese easily because the Japanese were uncultured and they were uncivilized people, according to people in the West. Well, the Japanese naval fleet actually defeated the Russian fleet and the war and the lasted a very brief period of time and actually the Japanese won. So everything Japanese in the United States and in the Western world uh, became popular. It was very exotic. And so they built a pagoda 
Um, they brought in women from Japan who served tea inside of it. Um, they brought over uh, Japanese decorations. They had jujitsu um, ex exhibits and exhibitions. Uh, so this was all things Japan. So this was a way of exposing the park goers to Japanese culture. And again, they were tying it into the current events of the day and bringing more people in. You know, Japan was the news. It was in the news constantly. People were fascinated with Japan. So why not bring, you know, a little bit of Japan to the park to make some money off of it? Um, so that's what they're doing. You can see a car here on the track as well. These, these um, again, the photographs are great pieces. You can see a car here too as well. Uh, photographs are great ways of finding out about what's going on in history as well. So we use photographs as historians a lot. I can tell you when this, um, when the automobile ride was uh, developed, it, it made front page news in the Kentucky Post. When Fair Japan opened, um, it was, uh, there was a full page ad taken out by the park. Um, and the newspapers did a number of articles, stories while it was being constructed. They talked about who was coming over. They talked about, um, you know, what kind of food was going to be served. And so we have great details about all of these things uh, from local uh, newspapers. And um, there was a magazine that also that uh, ran stories on the lagoon, a national magazine um, that um, had stories about the lagoon in it. So. We have multiple sources that um, that complement each other and tell the same story. So again, how historians do history, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of verifying your resources. It's a lot of making sure that you're just not relying on one resource, but you're finding two or three that say the same thing. Uh, but that's how history is done. And that's how, that's why we call it the craft of history. It is a craft, it's a talent, it's, you know, it's, um, it's documenting a story and making sure you're being as accurate and true as possible. Uh, here's just another really cool scene. This is a postcard. So there's these hand pictured postcards that are just wonderful. There, there's dozens of them um, that come that are about the lagoon. You can see one of the electric launches here. You can see the shoot the shoot so we can tell the time period, the dance hall. Here's the, uh, the boathouse again. Here's the scenic railroad. You can see the, the trestle again. Um, so just really great photographs that really kind of tell a story all their own. Uh, this was a um, one of the more controversial developments um, at the lagoon. This is the, um, uh, excuse me. I got a little ahead of myself on my notes. This is the motor drone. It was built in 1913 and it was built for motorcycle racing. In the, uh, the years before World War I, motorcycle racing became a huge sport, kind of like NASCAR is today. If you think of NASCAR today, they had a motorcycle circuit. So there were professional motorcycle racers who were going from city to city to compete and make money. There were purses. So it was kind of like a horse race or a, a NASCAR race today, but it was motorcycles. So the owners of the lagoon built their motor drone. This is all wood construction, by the way. And you can see the track is hitched. So this is a wooden track, believe it or not. Um, and it's a pitch track. And so um, the, the racers were moving up and down to gain more speed, to gain momentum, to pass one another. And then there, the seats surrounded the whole, so this is a saucer shape. It's a, it's a oval shaped track. The seats surrounded it. And you can see very vaguely right here and below, there is a wire mesh fence. So this wire mesh is what's separating the motorcycle from the seating. Um, the other thing that is strange at this time um, they were using a combination of lighting. So they had electric arc lighting, but they also had some gas fixtures around the, the racetrack because they did have races here at night. So you can see there's significant lighting around here. Um, it was uh, open on July 30th of 1913. Actually, it was open a little bit earlier. It was open uh, at the beginning of the season of 1913. On the, uh, the day of August 30th, 1913, they had 5,000 people attending a race. It was called the Moose Sweepstakes. Moose as in the International Order of Moose. 
um, the International Order of Moose sponsored the race, came up with the purse. Uh, Odin Johnson, who was one of the uh, circuit drivers, one of the most popular ones, he was from Salt Lake City. He traveled to Ludlow just to compete in this race. Again, these motorcycle race drivers were like celebrities. Of, they were celebrities of the day. Um, they were the Earl Earhart's of their day. Um, and so he uh, came to Ludlow to participate in this race. Again, it was 5,000 people in attendance. It was supposed to be a, um, a 25 minute race uh, and there were six riders. Everything went pretty much as normal until the 12th lap when Odin Johnson, it's believed uh, his motorcycle uh, blew a tire. His motorcycle flew into that mesh wire that we were talking about, so this mesh wire. The mesh wire held, so it did what it was supposed to do. Unfortunately, he hit into the mesh wire right underneath one of the gas lamps. The gas actually caught on fire and gas, lit gas was thrown into the stand. Now again, this whole complex is built of wood. Um, and so you can imagine not only the terror this caused, but also the panic. People were panicking. Um, the sheriff of Kenton County happened to be from Lalo at that time and was at the race. So um, he was kind of taking control of the crowd as best he could. People were running for the exits, as you can imagine. Um, and um, it was um, shocking for everyone who was there, obviously. Um, by the end of the evening, um, most of the people sitting in the front row uh, of that section were uh, the most injured. Um, we do have um, some scenes from the local newspaper. So um, this is um, the, the, uh, the Grim Reaper with a, with a fork showing the motor drone and how um, it's the, you can see at the bottom, it says a feast at the saucer, shall this orgy continue. So this is from the Kentucky Post. They were calling for the motor drone to be torn down and shut down. Um, we do know uh, by, the end, by the end of the day, uh, there were a number of deaths. Um, this is the youngest death. This was um, Charles Davis. Um, he was, um, a, a young boy, um, and ironically, he lived on Park Avenue, which is the, the street that leads to the park, the amusement park, um, and his, um, his mother and father rented rooms out to the motorcycle race drivers who were coming into town. Odin Johnson was actually staying at the Davis house um, overnight that night when the accident occurred, um, and so um, we, again, sources, we know Davis died. That was a newspaper article. Uh, we also have some wonderful resources out there now. These, this is a Kentucky death certificate. Uh, because it's 1913, there are death certificates. They started in 1911 statewide. statewide. This says, um, this is his date of birth, 1908, January 20th. His occupation is listed as a schoolboy. His father was Charles Davis. His mother was Edward Hume. They were, he was, father was from Kentucky. His mother was from Covington. Um, and it says here, cause of death, motorcycle accident, uh, extensive burns, um, gasoline explosion. So that's the cause of death. He was the youngest. Um, he's buried at Highland Cemetery. Um, and Allison and Rose, or um, the, the forerunner of Allison Rose was the undertaker. Um, it's a very sad story. Uh, again, here's a, an article uh, from the local newspaper um, about the accident. You can see they've, they've turned the entryway into a skull. Um, and it says races will be resumed Saturday, which is the case. They did resume, they did quick repairs and they opened the, the, the motorcycle, um, the motor drone open uh, within about a week. Um, no one, however, would sit in those, um, that portion of the stands where most of the people die. Um, but um, at that point, um, there was a lot of lawsuits being filed. The motorcycle, the, the motor drone was not owned by the people who owned the park. It was owned by um, a separate company. And so the park um, had some liability, but the company also had liability. So it was a very complicated series of, um, of lawsuits. 
Um, eventually, um, there was over 10 deaths. We really don't know a total. We do have death certificates from that time period, but we also know that many people were taken by automobile or, or by car or streetcar to the local pharmacy. We know some were taken to St. Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, we do have the St. Elizabeth Hospital records for that time period here at the Kenton County Library as well. So we've been able to look at the original hospital records. We've been able to look at death certificates here at the library and, and pair them together. So I do have a complete, as most complete list as I could find. There's a mother daughter, there is this five year old boy, and then there's many others. Almost all of them died due to burns, except for Odin Johnson, the motorcycle, uh, the, the, the race, the, the motorcycle driver. He died of a fractured skull. Uh, he, his young wife was there with him when she was watching the scene unfold. Um, and she, um, she was in her early 20s, I believe, when Odin died. He was in his 20s as well. Oh, shoot, didn't talk about that. We also, so that was 1913, 1915, we have a major tornado sweep through Northern Kentucky. This is part of the motor drown, the rebuilt motor drown. You can see the extensive damage. The park was extensively damaged by the 1915 tornado. Um, there was also a flood in 1913 that did extensive damage to the tornado. Um, and so um, you had the accident, the motorcycle accident, you have a flood in 1913, the motorcycle accident in 1913, 1915, we have a tornado. All of these things are well documented in local newspapers and diaries um, and in other accounts and in official records. Um, here's some more lagoon damage. You can see this is the, the scenic railroad. This is the dance pavilion that I showed you early on. You can see extensive damage to the dance pavilion by the 1915 uh, tornado. Um, this is another view of tornado damage. So it did extensive um, damage to the park. Uh, much of it was repaired and replaced, but at a high cost to the owners. But the thing that really kills the park is World War I. Now, we think of prohibition is 1920, which actual, the national prohibition of alcohol, the Volstead Act started in 1920. But we, we forget that in 1917, the US entered the First World War and we were sending uh, hundreds of thousands of men overseas and we were heavy into the war effort. So we were, we were reserving grain and other materials to send to the boys overseas. And so a beer production was uh, reduced greatly in 1917 and into 1918 um, to the point where um, beer was extremely hard to get. Um, and the park um, relied heavily on beer sales. It had already lost a fortune because of the motordrome accident uh, and pay, payouts to the victims. It had lost a significant amount of money during the damage of the 1915 tornado. The 1913 flood had done significant damage. Then prohibition hit. Uh, after the 1918 season, um, they the owners decided to close the park. Um, and most, the, the lake eventually was drained. Uh, when I was a kid, there was still somewhat of a lake there. We ice skated on it, but it was much, much smaller um, and much more contained. Much of the property that the park was built on uh, became in the 1920s was transferred into uh, subdivisions. So if you're familiar with um, Deverell Street, Stokes A Street and Ludford Street, those, especially the 300 blocks of those streets were all part of the park at one time. When I get my tax bill every year, it says Ludlow Lagoon Land Edition on it because it was originally part of the Ludlow Lagoon Land Edition. It was on the property of the lagoon. There are a few things that are left. This is the clubhouse. I showed you that picture, one of the first photos I showed you. The clubhouse still stands at the corner of Lake and Laurel Street. It is a private residence. When I was growing up, it had been divided up into apartments. It's now been uh, bought and it is a, um, it's uh, been bought by one owner who has done an enormous amount of work on it. Um, this building was in really bad shape for a while. Um, the owner has done uh, a lot of work to upgrade the house, to bring back its original character. Uh, this is the, what would have been 
that, that the part of the house that does not face the lake. So this would have been facing um, the opposite side of the lake. Some of the verandas on the lake side were ripped off of the building at times, um, but some of them are still there and he's restored those as well. So this is still standing. This, this shows you um, where, um, you know, where everything else kind of, if you know where this is, you kind of looking at photos, you can see where other things were as well in relationship to this house. Well, there's another house that stands at the corner of Park and Devil Street, sits up on the hill. This is a picture of the house in the early 1900s. This is a picture of the house from a few years ago. See all the original detail is still there. Uh, this was the caretaker's house. This was one of the caretakers in, 19, I think this is 1912, and his wife, and they just had a baby sitting on the front porch. Here's the house today. Um, again, you by using, we know where this house is today, obviously. We know where the clubhouse is. Around the corner and down a block is a set of stairs that I used to play on as a kid. It had a rope swing on it. It's still there. Uh, and we know from photographs exactly where it was. And so the Lolo Historical Society has used those steps, this building, this house, and the clubhouse. We have an insurance map at the library that shows the park in great detail. It was, it was built for insurance purposes. And it shows where all the rides were. It shows where everything was exactly located, including this house, the clubhouse, and those steps. They're all on the map. So they have overlaid that map onto a current GIS map, and we know exactly where everything was. Um, this map is incredible. Um, at first, we always thought that the park was much further west towards Bromley. Uh, we, found, we have found out by doing this triangulation with these, um, with these three pieces of property, these two buildings and this set of stairs that it actually was further east towards Dubu Park. Um, and so um, it, that map is just fantastic. It's a, it's a, a really nice way of using um, mapping, GIS mapping, using historical artifacts, meaning these two houses and those set of stairs, using modern technology and existing structures to map out where everything used to be. So we have this wonderful map now that shows exactly where everything was. It's amazing. Here's the stairs. They're still there. They're buried in the woods. Uh, there used to be a rope swing when I was a kid. We would hop on the rope swing up here and we would swing out and then swing back. And then it was a big old barge rope from down on the river. Um, and it was kind of a, a place to kids hung out back here all the time. Uh, but on photographs, um, the, the theater, this is the foundation of the theater. The boathouse would have been over here. So we can see this set of stairs on those photos. So again, it, it was a great clue to us of how to map this out. Uh, Andy Korn, who is an architect with many, uh, lives in Ludlow. He is on the Ludlow Historical Society. Um, used GS, GSI mapping and this insurance map from the library to lay the two over and come up with this map, which is just fantastic. Here it is. So this is Carlisle Field. Here is current Sleepy Hollow Road, this black line here. And this is Devil Street. This is the Lolo Bromley Swim Club. Um, so this is, this is Devil, this is Stokesay, this is Park, and this is Lake. So here is the clubhouse. Here is the caretaker house. And that little set of stairs is right here. So just by using those three things, using GSI mapping today and that insurance map, they were able to lay all of this over. You can see how large that lake is. All of this is filled in by now, at, at this point. None of this is lake anymore. And I don't remember the lake ever. The lake was never this far over when I was a kid. Um, now, when my dad was a kid, the lake was, was over to at least here, but the lake has been diminished greatly. Now it's just basically a stream that runs through here. The lake has pretty much been drained and has been filled in. But you can kind of see here, this is Carlisle baseball field. So when you're going down Sleepy Hollow Road, you can see the baseball field here. This is the motor drone. 
So this is where that accident happened where um, the 10 plus people were, were killed. Uh, this is the scenic railroad, the dance hall. This is the amphitheater and the theater, the boathouse. Here's the aerial ride. Um, this is the midway running through here. So again, using this technology, um, historians can also tell a story. Uh, and because the insurance map also, and the GSI map in particular, also shows elevations, we can tell you exactly, you know, this sat on a plane on the side of the lake. And you can see how the lake actually sat lower and that you, there was an upper park up here. And then there's a lower park down here where most of the rides were. So I am going to quit sharing my screen and open up for questions. Yeah. Um... Before we start the questions, would you mind going over the uh, the trivia question and answer again? We did have a winner that was Kevin Cottle, so congrats yep. to him. So the question was, what was the the model or the make of the um, of the um, automobiles on the automobile aerial ride? And it was Buick. They were Buick touring cars, and they were built. They were purchased in 1909. Uh, and they were used until the park closed in uh, 1918. Uh, I would love to find out where those, four, there were four of them. I would love to find out where those came to. But congratulations, um, whoever, whoever won the prize. Okay, and we can go ahead and get into the questions. We do have quite a few. So we'll okay. start off with, um, did the theater have a different name or was it called the Lagoon Theater? It was just called the Lagoon Theater, so it, it had it did not have a specific name. We do have one photograph of the interior of it, um, but uh, we only know of one. Um, so the second question was, when was the Shooting Star built? Uh, the shoot the shoots was built in nineteen oh. Hold on a second, let me make sure. Uh, Nineteen. Oh wait. Oh, sorry. Eighteen ninety-six. I was off by a decade. It was built in eighteen ninety-six, so it was built the second year. It lasted until nineteen oh six. So it lasted about ten years. So eighteen ninety-six till about nineteen oh six. Yeah. Um, our next question was actually asked by two different people, and okay. that was um regarding the trestle that you showed a picture yes. of. And it was whether it was for the, the Cincinnati Southern Railroad or the Fort Mitchell Streetcar Line. It was for the Cincinnati Southern. Uh, there was one that went over the Sleepy Hollow Road for the Green Line, but that's further uh, south. What, going further towards Fort Wright Park Hills, there was a, um, a streetcar trestle that went over Sleepy Hollow Road. But the one I've been showing in the pictures is much further north, um, right as you enter into Ludlow. When you go under the trestle um, on your left-hand side would be um, the Carlisle Field and on your right side, right over the hill is the Ludlow Bromley Swim Club. Um, okay, so our next uh, comment and question comes from Charlene on Facebook. And she said, how forested was the area west of Sleepy Hollow at this time? She said she knows that um, there was, it was later developed into Davu Park and was run with cattle and was um, mostly treeless. Um, there were portions of it that were somewhat barren. Um, the, the people had cut down some of the, some of the forest um, early on for firewood and other things living in their area, but there were still considerable amount of wood um in um in the west end of Ludlow at that time and also Dubuque Park so it was kind of a mix depending on where you were uh but the land between Ludlow along Sleepy Hollow between Ludlow and um going up to Fort Wright and Park Hills um was pretty pretty well forested and still is um and uh I, I think Janine Kreinbrink might be on here um, Janine um, has done work on the batteries that were built uh, during the Civil War. One of them is right near the trestle in Ludlow, uh, and then there's another one further uh, down Sleepy Hollow. There were two of those forts that were built uh, to defend Cincinnati from a Confederate invasion. Um, and again, um, 
resources we talk with. I've been talking a lot about historical resources and I've always wanted to find a Civil War ancestor. And a couple of months ago, I finally found one. I found a great, great grandfather who uh, mustered in in early, I think it was early September. I can't remember the exact month, but it was, he mustered in at the beginning of the month and mustered out at the end of the month. And I knew exactly what he was doing. So I found the division he was in, the regiment he was in, I looked it up. He was part of that movement in Northern Kentucky to build a force um, to defend the city from invasion. Most of those guys signed up for a month. So they went in, they built the fortifications and then their service was up. So technically he is a Civil War veteran. He, um, he is registered as a private in the US uh, Union Army. Um, and like many others in Northern Kentucky, that was his, he was older, he was in his forties at that time, but um, he, he officially was in, inducted in the Union Army for one month to build the fortifications. Yeah, and Janine actually just said that Battery Perry is closer to the trestle and Battery Bates is further south and that those parts of the park west of Sleepy Hollow are now on the National Register. Yes, so, and, thanks. A lot, and, and a lot of that um, credit goes to Janine. Uh, if you don't know Janine, she is a wonderful human being, but she's also a wonderful archaeologist who has done an enormous amount of work preserving Northern Kentucky history. So. Um, we have Jean, uh, Janine to thank for uh, a lot of the preservation of our history here in Northern Kentucky. So thank you, Janine. Okay, and our um, next question slash comment uh, comes from Casey Head, and he said, in today's world, all things tend to make a comeback. And he was wondering, why do you think that no attempts have been made to resurrect some aspects of Ludlow Lagoon? He said that he knows there used to be a bar in Ludlow, um, that was called Lagoon years ago that his father and mother met at. And it sat where he believes um, a newer building that trains folks in martial arts sits today. Correct. Um, so it was called the Lagoon Inn. It was uh, owned by the Katsikas family uh, who actually lived down the street from me. I knew a number of them. Um, he was a Greek immigrant. Um, and the Lagoon uh, Inn was located there on Oak Street between Lado and Bromley, right before, right at the creek line. Um, it was a very popular bar and eating place for decades. Uh, my parents talked about going there as well. Um, it, it was destroyed by a fire. Um, it was rebuilt. Actually, the, um, the Lado police chief um, runs a uh, martial arts studio out of the new building now. Um, on the other side of Oak Street is the Lagoon Saloon. So it's kind of a homage to the park. Um, it is an old grocery store that has been expanded and turned into um, a, a bar with outdoor seating. Um, it's kind of the place to be. Uh, it's owned by the folks who own the Ludlow Bromley Yacht Club before it had been hit by the, um, the barge. So the barge destroyed the Ludlow Bromley Yacht Club. They moved across the street and have um, formed a new business. Um, I think the park was never rebuilt for two reasons. Um, one, um, World War I, of course, and the, and the sale of beer it just became hard to get beer. And then by 1920, you could not legally get beer. And so keeping the park open was going to be extremely difficult. And the owners of all the property saw all of this great flat land that they could divide into houses. And this was the 1920s when there was a boom and Lalo's population was expanding enormously. Um, in the 1920s, Lalo added um, about 20% to its population in about 10 years. Most of those houses were built or many of those houses were built on the former Lagoon property. So the property became more valuable to be subdivided into homes than it did as an amusement park. Um, and then uh, eventually the lake was bought by Carlisle Construction and um, it's, it was used as fill. So um, when they built I-75 through the west end of Cincinnati, much of that uh, debris was uh, brought into Lalo and actually dumped back to fill the lake in. So um, the, the EPA capped um, the, the, portion of, the portion of the land back there uh, about 10 years ago. Um, you cannot dig, um, I think, I think it's a few feet into it, 
um, it's still considered a brownfield. Um, and so the property will probably um, remain um, either recreational or um, right now it's just vacant land. Um, and it's been that way for a long time. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to it. It's fewer and fewer parcels of, of empty undeveloped land in Northern Kentucky become available, especially in, you know, in the urban area. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that property, but it's a, it's a big chunk of property that the surface can be used for all kinds of recreational activities, et cetera. So we'll see what happens to it, but it would be great if it would be turned back into some kind of amusement attraction in the region. Um, and then our last question was asking if there was a way for people to see the overlay of the park, or is that kind of what you were showing on the last slide there? That was one of the things that I showed on that last slide. So you can always, uh, when 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 they uh, when Behringer Crawford posts this, you can take a screenshot of that. Um, if you come to any event, um, well, actually, the easiest way to probably see it is um, the city of Ludlow has a um, a museum. It's next door to uh, the city building. Um, and there is a display on the lagoon. And I believe that map is on display at the museum. Uh, it's only open on weekends, but they do have a Facebook page. If you go to the Facebook page, you can, kind of, you can see um, the hours, et cetera. Um, and they're working on expanding the museum actually. So it's a, it's a great time to go see their collection. It's a really neat um, museum of the history of Ludlow. Uh, they're, they're renovating the Historical Society has, uh, has uh, access now to the last remaining um, work, working building of the Southern Railroad in Ludlow. Um, and they are uh, remodeling it into a new museum. So the museum will probably be quadrupled in size, um, hopefully in the next year or so. So um, lots of interesting things happen. Um, Lolo loves its history and uh, the museum is, is a really cool place, but it's, it's in a very small location. So I would encourage anybody to, um, to go to the museum to take a look at it. And uh, if you wanna make a donation to, uh, to help us expand the museum, uh, you can do that as well. But uh, yeah, that map should be available um, at the Museum in Lolo. The insurance map, it's from 1894. The original of the insurance map is at the Covington Library in our history and genealogy department on the third floor. And actually all those newspapers I talked about today, all the photographs that you saw in the display today, in my presentation today, um, all of the sources that I talked about today, for the most part, are all available at the Covington Library. Uh, we have a great collection there of Northern Kentucky history uh, materials. And I think it's a really good example of, uh, in Northern Kentucky, we're really good at working with each other. And uh, quite a while ago, the, the museum and the library came to a partnership that the library would maintain um, the, the, the written history of Northern Kentucky. So we collect records, we collect newspapers, we collect photos. The museum collects items that tell the history of Northern Kentucky. We at the library collect those primary resources. So we're not competing with each other. We actually work really well together. Uh, many of the exhibits at the Behringer Crawford um, have photographs and things that came from the library that you know, uh, were copied and, and made available to them. So we try not to compete with each other in any way and we try to support each other as, as much as we can. And so it's great that you, know, you have these two institutions that are working really well together to preserve Northern Kentucky's history. And so that's why I love to be able to come and, and do these presentations because it's a way for me to get back to the museum. We did have one last question come in on Facebook. It yes. was, do you know anything about the Kit Kat Club that burned down in the 60s? Um, they think it is where Diamond Court is today. Oh, no. Although I do know where Diamond Court is. That's further down on Sepia Hollow Road. If I'm thinking of the Diamond Court, they're thinking of. Uh, there were riding stables along that um, along that stretch of um, CP Hollow Road at one time. There was a baseball park along that stretch. Um, all of those things are gone. I don't. I, I there was a roadhouse along that road. I don't remember it being called the Kit Kat Club, but I do know there was a, a murder that occurred. I think at that location or an attempted murder. 
Uh, we can help you out at the library. Um, we have all those newspapers from those time periods online or on microfilm. So if you call the History and Genealogy Department in Covington, um, we can help you out with that. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, so we would like everyone to know that in 2026, the United States is celebrating its 250th birthday. And to commemorate this Sester Centennial anniversary, the Kentucky Historical Society is seeking input from citizens, historians, cultural workers, and institutions statewide. Join, you can join Tyler McDaniel, Kentucky's America 250 Commission Administrator on Thursday, October 6th, which is this Thursday tomorrow, from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, for a community conversation to help conceptualize the local and statewide America 250 commemoration. Um, Faces of the Deep is on display at Berenger Crawford Museum um, through October 30th with a wide collection of submerged snapshots by the scuba diving duo John and Martha Lang. Um, make sure to come check it out. Also, you can learn more about the Lang's discoveries at a special meet and greet on Saturday, October 15th from 2 to 4 p.m. at Berenger Crawford Museum where the couple will share stories of the mysterious world of the deep sea. Children's and aquatic arts and crafts will also be included with admission and attendees will be entered into a raffle to win free passes to the Newport Aquarium. Our next Northern Kentucky History Hour will be on October 19th with John and Martha Lang on this great exhibit and how it came to be. So we hope that you all tune into that. That's all that we have for this evening. Uh, thank you again to all of our sponsors and our supporters of BCM. We'd like to thank the staff, trustees, and members of the Barons of Crawford Museum. Uh, and for more Northern Kentucky history through the week, you can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest installment of Curator's Chats with our curator of collections, Jason French. And you can also find all of the past history hours that maybe you may, might have missed. Uh, please like and subscribe to those. And until then, take care, everyone, and good night. Thanks, everyone, and thanks so much, Dave. And Richard Vokey just posted that it was the Sunnyside Riding Club. And yes, he is correct. And the Teddy Bear Lounge. He is correct. Thank you, Mr. Vokey. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you all.